Hey everyone, so recently I've been getting a lot of questions about how to beat passive players, how do I improve my, at my movement, uh, how do I beat parry and everything like that. I can't rank up, I always struggle, they always back up, and I can never hit them. So today, uh, live on stream, I'm gonna try and give you some tips, some tricks to hopefully help you out along the way. The first thing and the biggest thing, and if you don't do this already, this is probably the number one thing holding you back as a player, is to approach with your movement instead of approaching with your attacks. This is the advice I give all the time, and it's super, super important because approaching with attacks can hold you back in a lot of different areas. And what do I mean by that? First, I'll define it. Here is a simple example of approaching with an attack. Hello, I'm recording this in post because I'm stupid. Here is an example of approaching with movement. Or in this example, you're doing the attack to approach, and in this example, you're setting up your attack with your approach. So the attack is secondary to the movement, uh, as opposed to the other way around. And the reason why this is so big, if I'm doing a side light from here, yeah, it does hit. But the reason why this can be a poor move, or why this can be predictable, or you can get punished for this, is because it gives the ember enough time to react to it, and to respond accordingly. But if I'm this close, there's a lot of different things I could do. I could do an end light, I could do a down light, I could do a jump stair to catch their jump. I could even do a down sig, something like that. The number of options they have to worry about is far, far greater the closer you are. And obviously this depends on weapon, things, something like guns. Instead of being right here, you want to be around right here. It's just about knowing the spacing of your moves. But the general idea is that the closer you are to your opponent, the more options are limited from them and the less things that they can actually do, which I guess is technically the same thing. But uh, it's to say that, let's say I'm right here, they can't jump out of the way because my end light startup will be fast enough to catch them. Even if they jump, they're not going to be able to escape this. All right, so here we're up against a real human being. So I'll show off the two things that I just mentioned. First, uh, approaching with my attacks versus approaching with movement. So here I'm going to try and attack my way in uh, and we'll see how it works out for me. Now, this is not usually how I play, so it's going to be a little bit different because what I'm trying to do is I'm just like, oh, play, please hit, please hit, please hit. And it's not really working out. Now, that example was locking myself into frames. Yep, right there, that punish with that end light. You've probably been in that situation many a time if you're a sword player. Now, let's take a look at that same scenario. I'm going to approach the same way and we'll see how this Surrey responds to that. You, you'll notice, instead of immediately trying to fall down with the Sair, I made sure I was in the range for my down air, and then I approached. Instead of trying to just jump Sair, I made sure that, okay, here's where they're going to jump into the map, and they did a GC, so I'm going to try and punish that. If I'm quick enough, I'm going to be able to get that recovery. And you'll notice, when I'm in their space, the number of things that I can do starts to expand. Instead of, you know, only being able to do a side air, a side light, now I can get in, I can get closer, I can do things like down light, the highest damage punish. I can get a recovery as I'm getting closer to them. I can block them out with Nair, uh, and stuff like that. Now, it does get a little bit more complicated with that when you start talking about things like baits. Like this end light right there is a bait. They're not going to be able to punish me for it, but it gives them the idea that they need to. As you get to higher level, things start to get a little bit more complicated, but the general idea is still there, that you want to get in the range of your moves first, uh, and then go for an attack if you're trying to approach. So my Sair right there, a perfect example of a poor Sair. Uh, it's something that could get me punished, something that uh, can get me killed, and something that I don't really want to do too often. Something that I forgot to mention, and part of why approaching with movement is so important, is that most of the time when people are playing parry or passive successfully, they're not actually reacting to what you're doing because the startup time of most approaches in Brahala is unreactable. Instead, what they're doing is successfully predicting when you're going to attack and punishing you accordingly. What they're actually reacting to is more than likely their own prediction and preparation for what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Reaction time is heavily influenced by expectation and by preparation. So if being predictable, they can literally react faster. So if you switch up your timing and choose to focus on your movement instead, their job becomes a million times harder. Now the next thing I want to talk about is somewhat similar to that idea, and it is uh, locking yourself into animation frames. There's only a few things that you can do that actually don't affect your character at all. Jumping is a good example, where you're only really locked into animation for two frames. Moving around on the map, you're not locked into anything. You can do anything after moving left or right. Dashing, you're only locked in for the very beginning of it. Now these are very low risk options to move your character model around the map. Something that is high risk is moving around with attacks. Because attacking limits your movement, it limits what you can do next, it limits your ability to land something else. So let's say I, I try to Sair, uh, I'm locked out of Sair for a really long time, there's cooldown. As opposed to if I'm moving around and then try and Sair, I can move into the space first. So this is something that I see people do all the time when they try to play aggressive, is that they conflate aggressive play with quick play, which is not really the same thing. Obviously playing aggressive requires you to make a lot of quick decisions, but that's different from having 
having a high APM. Now, I'm gonna hop into an experimental queue uh, to hopefully try and show this off against a real person and show you the difference between locking yourself into frames all the time and then being more patient with them. So let's see. I miss the dodge punish or whatever it is, and then I immediately try and attack them again because I miss. This is the classic, what I like to call, rhythm. You get caught in the same rhythm of trying to attack and always missing, and then because of that, you're getting locked in these animation frames where otherwise you may be able to move around the map and get an e or have an easier time landing the punish or being more free with your movement in general. Really, the idea is to just be intentional with the way that you're moving around and the way that you're attacking. Because again, movement does not really lock you into very many frames. It can lock you into distance if you do something like a dash jump, so that's also something to be aware of. But generally speaking, the things that locks you in for the most amount of time is attacks. So you want to be very careful, especially against opponents that have a read on your movement. You don't want them to be able to predict what you're going to do next, because, you know, let's say you dip really low with a recovery, you can avoid getting hit with a downstick edge guard. Obviously, that's not to say never to attack quickly or anything like that. Sometimes it's the best option to do. Let's say your opponent is trying to punish you and you can stuff them in the face like that. It's just to be aware of the rhythm that you're in. That's the key. It's a about the rhythm. If you have a quick rhythm, then by all means attack quickly. If you have a slow rhythm, then by all means attack slowly. But you don't want to always have the same timing in between your attacks, or the same timing when you dash jump, the same timing when you approach, same timing in neutral. It's just about catching yourself when you're locked into those frames, when you're locked into that animation cycle, and snap yourself out of it. Because as you get to higher and higher level play, people will be able to catch on to your timing, and if they don't have to punish your attacks, and they can just punish you based on movement, their job becomes a whole lot easier. If you're moving in always at the same timing, if you're attacking always at the same timing, then their job is just to read that timing instead of to guess what you're gonna do. I was starting to lose my voice a little bit, so I'll just do the rest here off stream instead. Before moving on to tip number three though, one last addendum that I want to add to this point about rhythm and locking yourself in animations is that you want to be aware of it with regards to jump height and dash distance as well. Jump height is a little bit more straightforward, so all I'm going to say is try to learn the standard jump heights, uh, which can differ based on whether you start it from the ground or whether you start it from the air, whether it's interrupted with momentum based moves, think something like Gauntlet Sair, or if you fast fall, which by the way, Practice your fast falls, that's one of the quickest ways to improve your movement. When it comes to dashing, you have a handful of options at your disposal. You can do a standard dash by just pressing the button, you can do a dash while holding backwards, which is like a little mini dash, a dash while holding outwards, which enters you into a sprint state where you run faster than you normally would outside, I don't know if you heard that, it's 4th of July, it's probably fireworks. Uh, you can do a dash jump, a dash jump fast fall, uh, and keep in mind that you can also cancel your dash with most actions after the initial startup. Back dash also has a bunch of variants, but it doesn't enter you into a sprint state, and it also has significantly more recovery time. So why do I bring this all up? Well, unlike jumping or just moving around normally, dashes have a set horizontal distance that they always travel. Even the shortest variants move you forward a set amount. It's important to learn these distances because you don't want to overshoot or undershoot your movement as that can cost you a punish or even get you punished for poor spacing. One of the most common things I see is people whiffing moves like Axe Sidelight, which get an additional momentum boost from dashing because they just impulsively dash around to move without considering the distance it locks them into. The same can be said for players who only dash to move around, but I'll let the rasp be past me take this one away. Dash has significant amount of cooldown. This is the fastest that you can dash if you just mash the button. You'll notice I'm not just doing it as fast as I'm clicking, there is a delay in between my dash. And this means that if you commit to a dash and suddenly now you need to dash to get a punish, you're not gonna get the punish. You're gonna miss the punish because you've already committed to a dash. The same thing for back dash, which locks you in even longer. So what you wanna do is guarantee that your dash will be useful by either using it to gain space, gain ground, bait, or guarantee a punish. So if I'm right here, again, let's say I wanna approach and I'm, I've mixed up my timing, the Cassidy has no idea what I'm doing, a dash in sidelight here can cover so much ground. So it can be incredibly useful, you just gotta do it with the right timing because if the Cassidy reads this option, I'm out of luck. So to wrap this point all up, Try to be intentional with your attacks and movement, and try to recognize when you're falling into the same predictable patterns of getting locked into frames or distances, because then you're going to be able to move around more freely and control the flow of the game. Let's move on now to tip number three, which is mixing up your approach options. Changing when you're attacking is great, but you also want to mix up what you're attacking with. 
because a straightforward option, even with different timing, is still going to be a straightforward option. To keep this section relatively short, because you could honestly talk about mix-ups literally forever, it's like rock, paper, scissors. You can go, oh, okay, I'm going to do this, and so now I'm going to think you're going to go paper, so I'm going to go rock, but you think that I'm going to go rock, so I go paper and scissor, now my elbow cracked. Yeah, I'm just going to go over five of them, because again, you can do it forever. Keep in mind that in an actual game, you're probably going to be doing pretty much all of these in different combinations at all times. So don't get too caught up in the nitty gritty of this is number one, okay, and then this has to be number two, and then I have to do number three here. It's the general theories that are the important thing. So number one, the unreactable approach. This is the type of approach that can only be beaten if it's red because, I mean, well, you, you can't react to it. Usually this means you're in close range or within dash impulse distance, attacking with something like a sword end light or a guitar side light, low startup moves. Now this might sound a lot like just using your attacks to approach, which I recommended against earlier, but there's a subtle yet important distinction here. When going for unreactable approaches, you're calculating your spacing, and whether that's through intuition or explicit knowledge doesn't really matter, uh, but you're calculating your spacing precisely in order to make sure your opponent won't be able to respond in time. Your movement prior to the unreactable approach sets up the movement where you can even go for it in the first First place, so that's the difficult part. It takes some practice to recognize when you're in position to go for these, but they are very high value and it's part of why passive play is often weaker than playing aggressively. Number 2. The Unreactable Bait This is a classic move among people who are super good at pairing their opponents, and it's essentially getting into a position where your attack would be unreactable, but then choosing not to attack instead, and pressuring your opponent into making a bad move. A good example of this is the classic floating dare, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. In the moment, reacting to whether you dare or whether you jump is near impossible, so most people try to anticipate the higher immediate threat, which is the dare, and then attack before you can. If you're baiting that out though, it means it's just a free punish for you. If you're paying close attention to the game against the Asuri earlier in the video, I pointed out and did this exact thing in the first stock of the game. Number 3. The dash in to retreat Similar to the unreactable bait, this is all about pressuring your opponent to bait out an option that you can punish. You want to get in as close as possible to your opponent so that your quick movement in puts pressure on them, and then retreat just outside of where they could possibly hit you by backdashing or jumping or dodging back, and then punishing them accordingly. An example of this is going for a dash jump into a dodge back in order to bait out an anti-air from your opponent. If they don't bite the bait, then you're still okay, because now it's just back to neutral. You see different forms of this all the time at top level play, and if you're familiar with traditional fighters, this is very similar to playing footsies. Number 4. The Mark This one's all about tracking movement and shadowing where your opponent wants to go. As you start getting to higher and higher level play, throwing out raw attacks without proper movement setup becomes much more risky, as reading where your opponents are going to be, which is essential for the unreactable approaches, requires an extra level of focus. So, if you start paying attention to how your opponent tends to move, maybe they jump a couple times and then move in, or maybe they always dodge to bait you out in neutral, and then mark that movement with your own, you'll be in a much better position to attack them. An example of this could be if you're on the other end of the unreactable bait. Let's say someone's floating above you trying to axe stare and bait out a Gradon attack from you, instead of always trying to time your spot dodge or downlight them as they're landing, toss in a jump of your own every now and then and meet them in the sky where you can nair or say or recovery or whatever else. Either way, now you're in their zone instead of the other way around. And number 5 is the weapon toss. This one's risk level significantly changes based on a few factors like your opponent's health bar and how far the weapon toss will send them if it hits, how damaged you are and how far your weapon is from breaking, and how many current weapon spawns there are on the map. But it's a fantastic option, and with dash and dash jumps, you can get a ton of different angles and speeds to close the distance in on your opponent. You can even do a weapon toss bait non-weapon toss approach, I don't know what to call it, but you basically dash and then throw down only to pick your weapon back up again, which will likely confuse your opponent. There's a lot of stuff that you can do, and if the weapon throw lands, your choices will again depend on a bunch of factors. Whether or not they're grounded and limited in dodge options, how far away you are and how much stun they're in, which weapon you're using and which weapon your opponent is holding, there's almost like a mini game that gets created once you land the weapon throw about, okay, maybe they're gonna spot dodge, or maybe they're gonna jump, or maybe they're in enough stun for me to get this attack, and then maybe I can get that. It takes some experience, some time, some practice to learn the different scenarios, and it, again, it heavily depends on which weapon you're using, so I can't really go over all of that right now, but general rule of thumb is that until later HPs, weapon tosses usually serve to close the distance in and put you at a range where you can land unreactable approaches, or at least gain some map control and the pressure that comes from that. If the weapon toss has enough stun for you to get a guaranteed hit, then of course, by all means, go for the guaranteed hit. If you miss the weapon toss, uh, okay, well, you're gonna wanna make sure your unarmed is up to par, so definitely give some practice to that as well. 
like I said, there's a million other things that you could do. I didn't even mention dash and spot dodge, but that's great as well. Just try to mix things up, approach with different angles, use your dodge in different directions. Also, keep in mind that if you dodge into the ground, it's usually safer because then you don't go into full air cooldown. Anyway, just see what works. The more things you try out now, the more tools you'll be able to pull from in the 11th hour. Let's move on now to tip number four, which is to curb your impulses until your impulses are productive. Usually when I talk to people about rhythm, like in the second section, I would include this in there as well. But since this is a video where I'm introducing the ideas, I thought it would be better if I just made it a separate point. Keep in mind that the things I'm talking about in this section, as well as pretty much the entire video, has a one-to-one -one application for beating SIG spammers as well, which I'll talk about a bit later. One of the most common reasons why people tell me they struggle to beat passive players is because of a lack of patience. But I think there's an important distinction between patience in macro scenarios, like the entire match, and patience in micro scenarios, like in individual interactions. I think everyone can agree having patience across a long match is very important to build, but nobody really talks about the smaller stuff, like the split second delays on your attacks to throw off defensive timing, giving up on punishes because of poor positioning or slow reactions, holding your ground during movement or attack baits. These things pile up and usually end up determining who wins a match far more than an ability to stay calm for a few minutes longer than usual. There's a lot to cover on that topic, and given that this guide is primarily focused on aggressive play, let's talk about the second one, giving up on punishes. And I know, it sounds a bit crazy to suggest that one of the best ways to improve playing aggressively is to stop yourself from punishing your opponent, but it is a little bit more nuanced than that. Part of why winning in Brawlhalla can be so satisfying and addicting is because of that dopamine shot we get upon victory, and that includes all of the steps that led up to that victory. Landing extended strings or reading an opponent's dodge feels like a rush for that very reason, and so our brains try and replicate that experience and turn it into a recurring habit so that we no longer have to actively focus in order to achieve it, since that's tiring. And that's all well and good most of the time, but in the context of a constantly evolving mental battle with another human being like fighting games offer, you really don't want to be on autopilot all the time. Seeing an opponent miss gives our brains a chance for that dopamine shot, so oftentimes without thinking, we just go for an immediate attack because that's worked for us in the past. The problem is, when it doesn't work, we don't think about it, and so we never think to change or improve on it. If you go back in your replays and look at every time you got hit and every time you missed an opportunity to get a hit, odds are pretty high that a lot of it is because of deeply ingrained habits like these that you just didn't notice in the moment. That's why I often pair this point when talking about rhythm, because oftentimes it's about paying attention to the things that you never focus on, and those are really the ones that allow you to get a big breakthrough, because it's breaking what you always do. Sometimes the best thing you can do in an interaction is to do nothing at all. Give up on the interaction because maybe you weren't positioned well enough, or maybe you reacted too slowly to your opponent's options. It sucks, but you gotta move on sometimes and try not to fall into that sunk cost fallacy. Turn your attention to the next interaction, focus on reading and responding to what they're going to do next. This is probably the biggest reason why people struggle against SIG spamming. They see someone use a signature and then try and punish it regardless of their own positioning or the recovery time on the opponent's SIG. The thing is, your opponent wants you to make a mistake, so don't give it to them. Don't give in to the impulse because that's what they're feeding on. It's certainly not easy. It takes focus and experience to recognize when an opportunity is lost, and it takes patience and discipline to be able to put that recognition into action. And keep in mind that doesn't just go for the situation itself, but the choices that led up to it as well. I can think of a million examples of going for an attack or a punish without properly thinking it through first, getting myself hit in the process, and then proceeding to beat myself up even more for falling into the same traps over and over again. Never considering, mind you, that I wasn't understanding why I was in that situation to be trapped in the first place. If you're always struggling with the same things over and over again, try and consider what you're doing in the steps before it, because usually there's an answer there that you never would have seen otherwise. If you've ever watched me play on stream and I start to notice that I'm entering a super impulsive autopilot state, you might have heard me jokingly say that I'm going into ape brain mode, but honestly that's not even the worst way to remember it, because those habit circuits that I mentioned operate on a more basic section of our brain, with part of the purpose being that so we never have to notice them, and then we can use the more advanced areas for other things. The good thing is that because they function in lower processing, by using our more advanced areas like critical thinking, planning, and all that, 
we can overwrite and exhibit some executive control over our habitual impulses, and then move them in a more productive direction for the future. This is the really hard part, but you're gonna have to focus on the things that you do without thinking, the things that you do when you start to autopilot. The reason why everyone recommends to watch your replays, and me included, is because doing this in the moment is incredibly hard for all the reasons I mentioned before. But when you take a step back from the moment, you can look at all your choices more objectively from a bird's eye view, and literally see what your brain doesn't want you to see. Try to recognize when you're going into that ape brain mode, take note of when you start just mashing out of pure emotion, and create some new habits for yourself to follow in the process. Habits of that micro patience. Now this is a bit of a side note, but people often mention to me that despite maining a character for a while, for some reason they only seem to be getting better when they play other characters, and it doesn't really make sense since they have way more time in their main. But I think it makes a lot of sense when you consider these unseen habits, when you consider the ape brain. When you're learning a new character, you're constantly thinking about every choice since you don't have the muscle memory built yet, so progress is more visually apparent. But when you're well into the loops of doing the same things without being able to see it because your brain is literally making it harder to, it can be a lot easier to plateau and not see a way forward. Breaking through that with fine-tuned focus attention will be like opening a gate you didn't even know was there. The way I like to think about it is, imagine you're trying to climb this super tall mountain and you've tried and you've tried but you just can't do it. So you decide for yourself, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna buy a winter coat so I can sustain the cold and I'm gonna make it to the top. So you go out, you buy the winter coat and you get a little bit higher, but you still can't do it. So then you're like, okay, well I need hiking boots. I'm gonna buy these hiking boots, I'm gonna have more grip. So you get a little bit higher, but you still can't do it. Then next time you're like, okay, I'm always running out of energy. So I'm gonna bring a backpack full of food and water and I'll have more sustained energy to be able to climb the mountain, but you still can't do it. And so now you're left thinking, well, I've gotten everything I could get. What now? What am I supposed to do? Well, what if the answer isn't in getting more clothes or better shoes, but in your legs, how you walk? It's something you never think about because it's so deeply ingrained, but it could hold the answer for your pace, efficiency, your ability to set yourself up for the next step, your ability to climb. If you've tried your hardest to improve and just can't see any path forward, try looking sideways. Because who knows, that may invite a world of possibilities you never thought to consider before. So to sum up this category, finish off this last tip, focus on turning off your ape brain when it starts getting in the way of your ability to improve, and start training habits of micro patience during the rapid mind games throughout a match. I'm gonna warn you right now, it's going to be intimidating, and you're not gonna be able to do everything right away, and that's gonna make you not wanna try anything at all. But I promise you, even the tiniest moment of active attention can help to spark a chain reaction and get the snowball rolling for you. You've just gotta give it time. One final bonus point, and I'll just make it quick so it won't count towards the exam, don't you worry, is try to let go of your ego. If a passive player beats you, they beat you. No excuses, no ifs, ands, or buts. You may not like how they played, you may think they're unskilled, you may think you're better than them, and that they just had to resort to low tactics to beat you, but that's all stuff that you're making up. That's all based on some unwritten code you expect your opponents to unconditionally follow, because the only thing that actually happened is that they won. Don't let yourself take the easy way out and make an excuse. Accept the loss, or I mean it could even be a win, for what it is, and use it as fuel to power your improvement. When it comes to mental game, ultimately nobody can walk the path but you. So try your best not to let the voice in your head hold you back. It's painful, but if you can let go of those mental weights, you'll be amazed at just how far you can fly. Take care everyone, I'll see you in the next one.